Oh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Public health and communication needs. Can the UK afford not to listen? My name is Derek Mann, and I am the Director of Policy and Public Affairs here at RCSLT. I'll be chairing today, and I'm delighted to welcome Vicky Baker, the Director for Learning Disability and Neurobehavioural Sciences at Sussex Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, Janet Cooper, Clinical Lead in Speech and Language Therapy at Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent NHS Partnership Trust, and Barony Snapier, who is a Policy Advisor here at the RCSLT. Today's webinar will be 45 minutes long, and there will be questions at the end. You should be able to see on your screen a Q&A button that you can use to submit questions to us, and we've had some questions already. Um, and if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can use the chat button, and my colleague Kaylee Mayetta will help you with your technical issues. But it's worth saying too that this is being recorded and we'll go online with all of the slides after the event. Your feedback is important and you'll see a quick pop-up screen just after the webinar which we'd be delighted if you would fill in. And if you like multitasking you can also tweet and the hashtags are RCSLT webinar and public health. So you can see there what's coming up today, the SLT contribution case studies and resources and we're hoping that at the end of the webinar you'll be more confident about the speech language therapy contribution to public health and how to express it ensure that we're all using consistent language in this area and be clear about what it means here i've heard some practical examples of different interventions both facilitative and preventative and the evidence and know where to find resources and how to to make use of these so i'm delighted to hand over to berenice Good afternoon. I'd like to start by reflecting briefly on the definitions of public health. A very quick Google search will, will show you there are very many definitions in use. This particular one is from the Faculty of Public Health, but there are very similar definitions in use across all of the UK. And in fact, the definition used by the World Health Organization is also very similar to this one. We're going to look today at what these definitions mean in the context of your own work as speech and language therapists. So why promote the SLT role in public health? Foremost, we have a really positive story to tell. SLTs work across the patient life course and in many different settings. As SLTs, you will know that early intervention to spot communication needs can make a huge difference to how a child is able to access learning in the future. You will know the difference that can be made in preventing admissions to hospital for dementia patients with dysphagia. But in a difficult financial environment, those making decisions to reduce service may not know or accept those arguments. In addition, the impact of any proposed cuts may fall on society or other organisations rather than directly on the NHS. So that's why we need to keep gathering and highlight, highlighting and promoting evidence that supports public health interventions. Later on, we'll have a look at the resources to help. So what do we know about SLT's views on their public health role? This graph is from some research undertaken amongst allied health professionals. These results are for SLT only. As you can see, around 85% consider public health to be part of their role. It compares to research carried out in 2015 by the Royal Society for Public Health, which found almost nine out of 10 allied health professionals agreed their role should include an element of preventing ill health. So it's fairly clear that SLTs know that public health is part of their role. What seems to be more difficult is capturing the evidence that shows what the intervention interventions are and how they contribute to outcomes. So last year we discussed some of these issues with SLTs in Wales. The range of public health interventions they made was extensive. You can see here that their interventions applied in a wide range of settings. Some are person specific and some are universal, some are preventative and some are facilitative. They all relate to public health. This range and variety is at the heart of why it can sometimes be difficult to clearly express the SLT role. 
How do you describe it? Ideally, we would be able to frame such a wide range of possible interventions in a way that allows stakeholders to clearly understand our role and impact. We're going to look next at the ways in which our expert speakers have engaged with public health and how they have sought to measure and promote the impact of in their interventions. So I'd like to introduce Janet Cooper, who's the Clinical Lead of Speech and Language Therapy at the Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent NHS Partnership Trust. Good afternoon. Stoke Speaks Out is one example of a citywide strategy to support early communication development. It was developed in response to research evidence carried out by a local speech and language therapy department when they were commissioned as part of a local Sure Start programme. That was a government programme to tackle inequality in areas of high deprivation. There are many elements in our programme that are transferable to other speech and language therapy services. The Stoke Speaks Out approach focuses on universal and targeted services, but has a major impact on specialist services too. Many speech therapists are familiar with this three-tier model of universal, targeted and specialist services. Most NHS services are commissioned to tackle this specialist level at the top when children's difficulties are at their most severe and the risk to the child is the greatest, and most investment in speech and language therapy services is focused at this level. However, many children at this level have co-occurring conditions or precipitating factors that could achieve better outcomes if they were dealt with in a more public health approach. For example, children with spe speech difficulties might have underlying glue ear linked to smoking in the household or use of dirty dummies and bottles. If, this addition, if these additional factors are not also addressed, the speech and language therapy outcomes are much less effective. Other examples are where parents provide insecure attachments to their children, and this in turn affects the parent-child interaction, leading to significant pre-verbal difficulties and later language problems. Simply working on the deficit the child presents with will not create the same level of outcome as educating and supporting the parent in their relationship and modelling alongside targeted work. There are also a greater number of children at risk of SLCN in the middle and bottom tiers, particularly in areas of deprivation where research tells us that children are more likely to present with delayed language, upwards of 50% according to an ICANN study. Left unsupported, these children might require specialist services in the long term. Prevention and early intervention are a much more cost-effective way to support these children and can utilise the skills of a much wider workforce. The link between poverty and deprivation and speech and language ability is really well documented. The National Literacy Trust have recently published a report that links life expectancy to literacy levels and as literacy is dependent on language development there is an automatic link. There was a difference quoted by as much as 26 years between being born in Stockton Town Centre where literacy is low and North Oxford where literacy is high. There's also a youth justice report in 2004 by the Audit Commission that estimates a child with SEND and communication disability cost society upwards of £153,000. Um, the College have funded a return on investment study on, speech, on Stoke Speaks Out in 2016 and that indicated that in the short term for every pound spent there is at least a £1.19 return and in the longer term around £4.26 return. This kind of information is really useful when making a case to commissioners that prevention and early intervention are essential, not a luxury. The initial research carried out across Stoke-on-Trent indicated that around 64% of our children presented with language delay by the age of three years, clearly identifying a need to tackle the root of the problem rather than the firefight once difficulties were established. For a rounded public health approach, you need to consider how you can influence all layers of the system that impacts on the child. Clinical services traditionally focus on the child and making changes within the child. A wider public health approach would consider the impact of the other layers and what changes need to be made to them to ultimately affect the child's speech, language and communication. For example, a supportive parent-child interaction model may be lacking and the child may need, the need may lie with the parent to be shown how to interact more positively to assist the child's development. In addition, the child's school or setting might need training to understand the child's level of development and targeted ways they can support this. 
Parents are often more influenced and informed by friends and family and a community approach might be necessary to highlight the SLCN issues in a particular area. Stokes picks out use this model similar to Bronfen Brenner's model of ecological change to affect change across a whole community in Stoke-on-Trent and listeners might want to consider how their work impacts on all the tiers of this model. The public health approach places less focus on changing the child and more focus on the surrounding systems. The main activity at this level is to identify the level of need. To do this, we've developed an early communication screen and have trained every private nursery and every school in Stoke-on-Trent to be able to administer this to children two to five years. They send their data in centrally to us so we can analyse the city picture and target resources to those most in need. And currently this gives us intelligence on over 8,000 children. There are a range of screen tools available nationally and the key is gathering this data, sharing it and using it to inform service development. According to Charles de Forge, parents hold the most influence over their child's development, particularly in the early years and primary years. So this layer of support is essential for universal targeted and specialist support. Many parents struggle with their own language and literacy. And one of the key activities you can do to promote this area is to ensure the readability of all information you share or send out to promote health literacy. In areas of deprivation, around 60% of adults have a reading age of 11 years or below, and this will affect access to services, non-attendance rates and uptake of advice. In start, we start way before children are born with our communication champions visiting antenatal clinics to have informal conversations with parents to be about early development through to parent workshops in settings and schools and training parent volunteers and communities to provide the key messages. We've also got a little library van, which is a Tesco sized van that travels to communities. And that's a hugely successful way of modeling positive storytelling to parents. One of our current focuses is on a meaningful parental engagement, not just counting numbers who attend, but the impact it has on their parenting. At setting and school level, you're able to influence a wider workforce to support SLCN. And this is a very cost effective way of supporting children. Quite often, there's a variety of quality and confidence that needs supporting. We've developed a range of resources to support the children's workforce and embed best practice. This includes things like a child development tool in response to practitioners telling us they felt that they lacked confidence in their knowledge of child development milestones and things like the screening tool, leaflets and handouts, as well as a range of training courses. Anecdotally, our course speech and language therapy service tells us that once the settings attended Stokes Speaks Out training, they're much more able to follow specific advice and programmes, therefore enhancing the specialist service provision. The community can both influence and support families and social media is a great way of reaching this level, as well as face to face activities prominent in the community. Social media is also a quick way of reacting at reaching a wider audience. Locally, our parents were given the chance to say how they wanted to hear from us and they chose Facebook as their preferred method. Sometimes it's harder to evidence the impact of this. So we've devised a questionnaire that goes to every parent at the 12 month baby check during March every year through the health visitor clinics. This tracks parental confidence and knowledge of the Stokes Speaks Out key messages such as dummy use and background noise. And we compare year on year how well these messages are getting through to families. Whole services can also be influenced by universal and targeted work, ideally so that the processes join up and there are clear pathways between services. One example we've developed is a stage pathway toolkit used by every health visitor in Staffordshire and the children's workforce in Stoke-on-Trent. They've received this as part of the Stoke Speaks Out training. This contains a flowchart which highlights the need to reduce environmental risks and try targeted work prior to referral. Referrals are only accepted to the core service if the pathway has been followed. This protects the specialist layer of the service and ensures that only those with the highest risk and the greatest need access the specialist provision. By embedding good practice across the city, we're therefore ensuring that every child is given the best opportunities to develop. Berenice will cover the outer layers of the model later, but I hope you'll see that the value and potential of a universal and targeted public health, public health approach for children's SLCN. However, public health approach is not unique to children's services. And here we have Vicky Baker, who will share an adult service model. 
Oh, hi everybody. Um, I'm Vicky and I've always worked in learning disabilities. So I'm here to talk about the language of public health and to really think about is it new or is it actually business as usual? Um, anyone and everyone who's worked with people with a learning disability will know about the inequalities that people face every day. Their access to health, education and employment are all affected by their learning disability. And as speech and language therapists, our focus has always been to reduce these health inequalities by addressing their communication issues, not just for the individual, but for those who directly support them and those of the wider community. So the focus today of my presentation is about how crucial it is that as a profession, we're able to articulate that our fundamental role in addressing communication issues with whichever client group we work with is essentially a public health role. It's what we're about as a profession, but we just need the hat and the lens to describe our work in this way, just like this. We have to don a public health hat and we have to look through a set of public health lenses. Easy. So how do we as speech and language therapists improve health and well-being in the broadest sense? Essentially, this is how do we enable people to make healthier choices? How do we minimize the risk and impact of illness? And how do we reduce health inequalities? And it's the latter that I'm going to focus on today in discussing speech and language therapy work in adult learning disability. And I'll try and give you some examples throughout. In 2013, there was a confidential inquiry into the premature deaths of people with a learning disability. And that demonstrated that on average, men die 13 years sooner and women 20 years sooner than their non-learning disabled peers. It's a shocking statistic. Yet it's all too clear how central communication disability is when you look into the reasons why people face these inequalities. This is about the impact of having a communication disability and not just thinking about the person's impairment. Addressing communication need with a public health focus is not, for example, thinking just about how many information carrying words I understand, whether I can use prepositions if I've got word finding difficulties, but the relationship between this and can I be helped to understand how important it is to check if my breasts have got lumps? Can I tell people I'm in pain? Can I learn how to manage my sexual relationships more safely? Therapists working in learning disabilities do wear a public health hat and lens, and they target their work in understanding communication difficulties whilst focusing on the impact that these have on a person's health and well-being. So there are numerous reasons why these health inequalities exist, and these are the um, examples given from that um, confidential inquiry. Uh, this slide has got all those uh, reasons identified, and as you can see, both the communication disability of the person themselves and the communication skills of others is key. This is all about relationship. There's nothing new here. People often struggle, for example, to express and understand their health conditions, the treatment options available to them, the side effects, impact of having or not having interventions, managing and expressing pain, not undertaking usual health screening. Um, the Mental Capacity Act is often misunderstood and misused, and reasonable adjustments aren't made for people's communication needs. And dysphagia, of course, speaks for itself as a life, death, health issue where speech and language therapy is key. Um, as Janet described for children, so we can describe this for adults, the need to work at all levels and not just locate the communication issue or disability inside the person, but to focus on the support system and the wider community. This is well described in all the adult learning disability literature, and we've been doing this for years. Um, recently, in the Adult Learning Disability National Network, we're looking specifically about how we capture the work outside of the referral process uh, based on a national benchmarking that we did last year. We think that's at least 10% of our standard work. There are four domains of public health uh, that we can apply to speech and language therapy work in learning disability, and these four domains are taken from the um, Allied Health Professions Public Health Strategy. Firstly, there's health protection work. For example, how do we support people to uptake flu vaccinations this year? Um, and then there was a recent example from our Adult Learning Disability Network from Suffolk, where the therapists work with GP surgeries to increase the uptake of cervical screening. The head of the screening programs in the CCG wanted help to improve the uptake of cervical screening by women with a learning disability. Previously, believe it or not, if people were known to have a learning disability, they were not invited for the screening because of their learning disability. So the CCG requested the speech and language therapist to translate their invitation letter into easy read. Uh, that was a challenge because of the sensitive nature of the subject and the need to contain service and um, certain terminology. But the therapist worked with the practice nurses and developed an easy read letter that was sent with a standard letter. Um, it was also clear that that alone was not enough. So they put in an additional um, support tool 
to invite the person to bring someone who supported them with them to the um, meeting and to look at how they would give informed consent to the test and what extra support they needed. Um, the second domain is looks at wider determinants of health and this includes all of the work that speech and language therapists do in support of people accessing education, employment and housing. And our five good communications standards describe what good looks like and how to achieve this and how we can develop good communication environments or what are now termed capable communication environments. Um, and I should also mention that we're really well placed as therapists to articulate the needs of adults with speech, language and communication needs who fall between services and often have unmet communication needs. Um, I'm lucky enough that we have a service in West Sussex that specifically works with this client group and we've been able to assess the people and to, to look at um, to advise housing, mental health services and employment services about what support they need. The third quadrant is around health improvement and like all allied health professions the making every contact count agenda is really important. So as a speech and language therapist working with someone's communication and dysphagia I also need to notice and be interested in the key health issues for them their smoking and their alcohol use, their diet and risks of obesity, and how their communication skills affect this. Our initial assessment process takes into account um, for any profession when they first meet somebody, a whole range of health issues that we know contribute to a premature um, death. And in learning disability, our work is nearly always part of multidisciplinary teams. So the work, for example, of speech and language therapists working with communication and challenging behaviour and our work with physios on respiratory care all contribute to an overall health improvement agenda. And then finally, there's all the work that we do as therapists in general to support people managing their own health. This is any advice that we offer as therapists to support people to manage their own difficulties better. We've got numerous examples of this and here's two very recent case examples. Uh, one included a therapist and a nurse working together to explain to somebody about a potentially life-changing heart operation that they'd initially refused and they were deemed as having capacity to refuse. And the nurse and the therapist went through with pictures, the risks, what the surgery entailed and what the outcomes would be and other ways to manage their anxiety and the person had their life-changing surgery. Another I heard was via a fantastic compliment from a grateful parent about one of our therapists who was working with a young woman who was having treatment for a serious liver condition um, and was being assessed for suitability for the transplant list. And there were multiple issues about her ability to consent, her fear of hospital procedures and the hospital staff's misunderstanding of her disability and their need to make reasonable adjustments. Initially, the therapist thought that they would just be involved with making the relevant information more understandable, but her mum was doing a great job of that. And actually, what they needed was help um, to understand how to communicate with the young woman when she was there and the impact anxiety had on her levels of understanding and cooperation. The biggest risk was that she would have refused a possibly life-saving procedure through fear, and the hospital would have interpreted this refusal as a well-thought-through decision made with someone with capacity. By identifying her communication difficulties and the fact that she had an autism spectrum condition, the therapist was able to help the hospital understand what support she needed, how to involve her in decisions and how crucial her mum was with this and at all points in her treatment. And the mum particularly said that the therapist had made an amazing difference to her daughter's life because she took the time to know how her daughter, her daughter and the difficulties she faced when she attended hospital appointments as this was the area of greatest impact. Um, and she went on to say that her experiences at hospitals have dramatically improved. So I'll end there with my whistle stop um, tour as to how the language of public health isn't big and it isn't clever. It's what we do and it's why we do it. And I don't think you can separate communication disability and public health. But I do think we need to use the language of public health in our work so that we can claim our rightful place as a profession with a massive amount of skill and expertise to offer the public health agenda. So I'll just pass you back now to Berenice. So we've heard some really good examples there of how public health is an integral part of much of our work. You might now be thinking, well, how do I do this in my team? You could start really simply by just talking in your team and looking through the resources that are already available. You could think about how your work falls within the four domains of public health that Vicky has just described. Or you could have a look at um, the RCSLT public health fact sheet and just use that as an agenda. You might then go on to think about whether that is something you already measure or not. And the RCSLT is doing some work to develop an outcomes measurement tool. So it would be worth keeping up to date with that um, and how that is progressing. And all the details are on our website. 
In addition, the Royal Society of Public Health has developed a toolkit to help measure public health outcomes. I think the main thing is just to let us know how you get on with that. We're really keen to hear about successes and case studies because that helps us with our influencing. So thinking a little bit more widely now about what you do in order to influence more widely. You might feel that you're not in a role where you can have that wider influence, but you may still be able to make clear the SLT role in contributing to wider public health outcomes in your own organisation. It's really important to talk the language of public health. So think health inequalities and social disadvantage. We have lots and lots of facts and figures at RCSLT to help back this up. Have a look at our public health and STP fact sheets. They've got lots of figures and information that would help you do that. Public health budgets are under pressure, so commissioners are obviously looking for potential savings. Just be aware that while the NHS is not necessarily going to take account of impacts that fall outside health, certainly local authorities, STPs, accountable care organisations may well be more open to arguments about the impact in your own locality that relates perhaps to justice and education and on society. And lastly, keep in touch with us about it. If you have any case studies that you think demonstrate public health outcomes, please let us know because our own influencing relies on them too. And so lastly, I've just got a couple of slides just to highlight some of the fact sheets that I've already talked about. Uh, the public health fact sheet and the STP fact sheet both have information and some, some good diagrams that will help you make your cases and you're very welcome to use those. Uh, also our fact sheet on the intergenerational cycle. Uh, lots of good information on that to show the links across the whole life cycle to public health. I'll also highlight here the um, Royal Society for Public Health toolkit which aims to help AHPs record and measure the impact of their brief public health interventions. Thank you very much Bernice and thank you to, to Janet and Vicky. Um, we have a number of questions and indeed we have questions coming in right now. Um, so I can tell you right now, I'm afraid we won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll do what we can. Let's begin with a couple around making the case, I guess. So somebody has said, what strategies can we use to make speech and language therapy heard amongst all the other public health issues? And someone else says, given the current pressure on services to meet the needs of, of children in the case of this question, with identified significant speech language communication needs, is it feasible to provide a preventative service. Janet, do you want to kick off? Yes, I think there are always coexisting priorities. There always are going to be multiple pulls on funding streams. And the key, like Berenice and Vicky have said, is ensuring that you use shared language and you make demonstrable links to public health priorities. So things like social mobility, health literacy, they are all things that join together for the public health agenda. We can't afford not to tackle this area. We can continue to pick up those who land on clinic caseloads, but actually as a profession, it's up to us to share the cost effectiveness, providing that universal and targeted level support. Thank you. Vicky, anything to add? Um, I, I would just add again, it's, it's the use of the language that's being used by commissioners. So where people are using particular language around public health issues that we just need to use that same language and to have the confidence, um, even if we don't necessarily have all the detail and all the facts and all the evidence base, there's a huge amount of work from patient and family stories about how speech and language therapy have transformed people's lives in a whole range of issues. So I would always go back to give, giving examples from um, carers and from users about how we've influenced people at a very, very um, specific level. I think that makes a huge difference. But basically, it's know the language of public health and use it in every forum that you get a chance to. Thank you very much. We've had a couple of questions around evidence. We've had a question saying, what do you see as the main gaps in evidence in regard to the role of SLT in public health and how SLT services can fill the gaps? 
And we've also had a question about improving the evidence base for the effectiveness of the, the SLT role in public health, perhaps particularly in universal and targeted. Who'd like to go first on that one? Shall I answer that? Just yes. to say about the work that college are doing um, with the uh, children's development strategy, sorry, the child strategy, and also the Adult Learning Disability Network, um, that Catherine Moyce, who's leading the work on the outcomes work, is specifically looking at the work that we're doing with children and with adults with a learning disability outside of the referral process. So there's lots of work going on looking at how do we capture that outcome. So we would be able to send some information about that after the webinar. But basically, there is a lot of work going on at college to look at the, a whole range of different outcomes and how we can look at that for work outside of the referral process. And I'd just like to add that actually there's an AHP strategy for Public Health England that college is represented. In fact, Vicky, myself and Berenice attend those meetings and this is very much high on the agenda there. So we are well represented. Um, there is a piece of re research go taking place in Sheffield and it's been uh, relaunched to look at the evidence base. It is still really thin and I think that's because people are not submitting their evidence enough. So as a, a plea to our profession really to continue to provide that information and there's a strength in numbers. Thank you. Um, Bernice, I wonder if I could just come to you. Just one question here about organisations such as Public Health England and how, how they fit in with the public health agenda whether it, when it comes to speech and language therapy. Yes, I, I think as um, Janet has um, already said um, we are represented on the um, Public Health England um, Public Health Strategy Board sorry bit of a mouthful there um, we take part in those conversations we um, take part in the projects that they run uh, in working with other allied health professionals to pull together information um, about public health and how we're all working on that agenda so I think we are involved with Public Health England work. Uh, I would say that they, they are often looking for good case studies. Um, I feel I've said that already, but it, it remains true. So I, I would say if you have a good example, don't feel constrained in, in sending it in to us. We can work with you to change it into whatever the right format is. So we're always looking for those examples because it helps us wherever we, we're influencing. Thank you very much. Um, Vicky, a question's come in which I think relates to what you were saying. Um, proving to managers and commissioners that a, a speech therapist is needed to help patients with communication needs understand public health matters rather than as an advocate. And I think you say on, I mean, I guess both of those roles are important, but um, any anything to say on that? So I'm sorry, I'm just reading the question. It's on the screen next to me. So can you just say it one more time? Uh, certainly. The the question is around making the case that we we need that speech therapists need to be involved in helping patients with communication needs to understand public health matters, as well as being an advocate in an individual case. So actually explaining to the yes, population yeah. of people with a learning disability about public health. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I think a good example of that is if you know within your local public health strategy what their key issues are and what the key priorities are. So, for example, in RSTP, it's very much obesity. We know that there are huge issues for people with a learning disability um, and diet and whole issues around, you know, people not understanding about people being able to consent or not consent to those sorts of issues. So if you know that obesity is a big issue for your population and you know it's a big issue on the STP then I'd be talking about what does a speech and language therapist do for somebody who might be at risk of obesity and I would be talking to the people who are leading around the obesity strategy about what a speech and language therapist should be doing um, and I guess when I know what the STP are doing around obesity I'd be thinking then how do I then translate that to the people that are having the biggest impact on people with the learning disability themselves so what reasonable adjustments do they need to make to those strategies are they aware of what the particular issues like we know around the mental capacity act um, and advocating in that way if that makes sense sorry I haven't asked about that clearly, clearly. does that um, yeah, yes that, that, that's great Vicky and, and mentioning the mental capacity act reminds me that you know, the the work we do on public health is obviously UK wide and it goes across all of the different jurisdictions but I think in, in we mentioned public health England particularly because actually there, there is a particular focus with PHE which you know, is, is why we've got a particular thing there rather than being England centric. Um, I want to go to a question which picks up I think things that you've all you've all 
already covered a wee bit, but let's um, expand. Somebody, somebody asks how we can build community capacity to support speech and language therapy, and they talk about parent support groups, general advice. I know you've mentioned that a bit, but Janet, do you want to expand on that at all? Yes, I mean, there's lots of skills out there that obviously need lots of training and um, speech therapy input too, but there are lots of people in the children's workforce particularly who can reach the children and the families that we need to get to. So one of the examples we've developed is um, parent ambassadors. So they get training from our core team on the key messages for Stoke Speaks Out. We keep it very basic and simple and practical, but they are families who then can talk in their own communities it might be very informally at the school gate or it might be that they go and help at stay in plays but we're then aware that they've got the knowledge and skills to pass that information on um, and you can't underestimate the power of parents supporting other parents um, it does need a catalyst of a team to support that it can't just happen i don't think without some kind of investment and, and it's about kind of quality assuring that level of, of input as well um, but certainly we've got a parent volunteer in one of our areas in the south of the city who runs a little stay and play group with very little support from us now, actually. And she gets all those key messages into those on a weekly basis. Oh, and I just can't emphasise enough about knowing your local voluntary sector organisations and what their priorities are and your care, um, carer groups. Recently in West Sussex, we've made much better links with our care organisations and we've been working with them to say what would make the difference for the, their um, children um, and talking adults. Um, and they've been talking about, for example, they really don't, they want to lose the whole referral process if possible, and be able to talk very directly to therapists very quickly about specific health issues. Um, so we're looking at a very different approach in West Sussex outside of the referral process, specifically to look at health issues for people, because that's come from carers. So as Janet said, carers knowing other carers and being able to spread the word and talk about things that have helped their son or daughter in particular issues is much more important than lots of individual referrals to lots of individual therapists. So. I think you really need to know your community support services um, and to know what they're doing and how they can influence and then work with those. Can't emphasise how important that is. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've dealt with a lot of the question areas that have come in. Some people have given us some very interesting questions, particularly about the international context and also around the Institute of Health Research and some we'll get back to you on some of those more specific and technical ones. But I think we've covered the general questions that have come in. So. I will draw us to a close. Thank you very much again to all of our participants. Please do check the RCSLT webinar web pages for the presentation. And please do keep an eye out just after the webinar ends for an evaluation questionnaire which will pop up. Um, we'll have a webinar in April and there will be a webinar on the 5th of June with the Motor Neuron Disease Association on living with motor neuron disease, supporting speech, communication and swallowing. So with that, thank you to all participants, thank you for joining and good afternoon.